you know, people think I uh, smoke way more pot than I do. I, th I found that I smoked, pot. like Carlin said, he smoked less as he got older. It went from getting high to write the joke to later on writing the joke, then coming back, look, looking at a little stone, like, oh, okay. I, 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 the more I get involved in marijuana, and the longer I go into my career, the less I smoke, which is weird. Well, I certainly hope you don't become one of those pussies who gives up entirely. No, 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 I'm no, no, I mean, no, no. Look, no, no. I'm, and you're not a pussy if you give it up. People change, but like... I like the old rosters, man. Like, if you sit around and hang out with one of them, they'll fucking smoke and give you life lessons and shit. I, I want to be that old. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, my friend Woody Harrelson has quit a few times. No. But we always got him back. Okay. I mean, there's... there's <laughs> so, so, but <laughs> I've done it. It's like an intervention in reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've, done it, I've done it once myself. I know Willie Nelson did it because I know there's that famous story where something, what he was trying to be good and good and good, and then he finally he's with Willie and Owen Wilson or something, and of course there's like, the, the, these guys are going to be smoking a lot of pot, and he couldn't wait anymore, and he grabbed the joint, and uh, Willie Nelson just said, I do, Welcome home, son. Welcome home. <laughs> I do three day stints. Wait, will you have a drink? I, I just, I will drink with what you. What is that? This is just ginger ale. Well, what do you want? I'm, I drink whiskey. What, drink. What, <laughs> is that this? Huh? Ooh, shit. I don't know. Usually I'll drink a Johnny it Walker. It says yeah. Canadian whiskey. Well, Canadian whiskey. I never knew what whiskey, whiskey was. It's like a. I, now I only drink about four times a year, so I'm not a whiskey drinker like I'm, I'm well versed. You only have alcohol four times a about year? Four times a year. I smoke a lot of marijuana. <laughs> You know? <laughs> so, I, I figure you can't uh, be fat. You can't, you know, can't like food, whiskey, and weed. You got something's got to go. So you, you, you picked the right one. Yeah. <laughs> no, of, of all, I mean, of all the things in the world that yeah. are horrible for you, and there's many of them. But really, there's nothing worse than liquor. There's a reason they used to put a skull and crossbones oh, no, on the fucking it. bottle. Yeah. But you know, right now I am so dry I could ball a camel. No, I'll, I'll have a drink with you, Richard Belzer. Now used my to grandfather. Say. But. What, so what do you want? This? You want this? I'll, I'll drink it whatever whiskey wh you're drinking. I don't drink whiskey. I drink tequila. Is that Jack over there? I'll just keep wow. it classic and go Jack. Yes, I used that used to be my drink. So I'll do Jack. You know that I drank so much of this <laughs> that they sent me a deed to a one-foot plot of land <laughs> on the Jack in Jack. Tennessee so I could officially be a... Squire, it looks like I'm doing an ad for it. I'm just telling a, I'm just telling a story and saying, thank you, Jack Daniels, for that plot of land. I'll have to visit it sometime. Speaking um, of plots of land, you got a compound here. This is like the Godfather. This is amazing. <laughs> this shit is like, man, my wife is in a whole nother house. We're in a club. We're, we're in a club. You it's have a, a club. It's cool, right? I would have brought the girls from the flame had I known. We were oh, going. we have to talk about that. Okay, we got to talk about it. Oh. First of all, I love that place. I read it's in trouble. I don't think I think it's going to be okay, but it's always it's you know perpetually, you know. <laughs> of they, course, they, they don't want strip club club. I mean, Mike, oh, such a stoner. I poured. What did I pour in here, Jack Daniels? You poured Jack in there. Okay, you want that with something? No, no, just ice. Just ice. The ice brings out the flavor, pops out the sweetness in it. The Oh. Oh, wow, you're pouring. Excuse me. Well, if you, well, well you're that's not what mix the guy told me when he poured whiskey or ice. But you're not mixing it with anything. No, I'm not mixing it. Right, so I'm giving you more. No Barack Obama. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, what were we talking about? We, uh, we were talking about oh, the blue flame may be in trouble. Well, okay, but before we get to the trouble, I just have to say, you know, I've told this story now to a few close friends just because it was so close to my heart, this, you know, that you took me into a place. I mean, it's so funny because when I said to a few people, I said, you know, when I'm going to Atlanta and Mike's going to take me to, he, like, where he hangs out, breaks his new records and yeah. stuff. Because, you know, <laughs> that's where, strip clubs are yeah. where records are. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Okay. So a few people said to me who they thought they knew their shit. You know, they were like, oh, I know. It's the Magic, Magic City. Magic City, yeah. Okay. Which I also go to. But it's okay, not but... Well, you said to me... We're not going to Magic City. And that's for tourists. Yeah, it is. It's for tourists. And, and <laughs> so, like, I, I, must, I must say, it was... First of all, the driver didn't want to go. Yeah, fuck you. I, I know. <laughs> yeah. Because he thought it was too dangerous. Uh-huh. <laughs> I never felt any danger. Because you weren't in any danger. Because I was with you, first yeah. of all. Right. I, know, I, I mean, I thought... The, first of all, I was very impressed. Yeah. I thought it was going to be a hole in the wall. No. It was very nice. Yeah. yeah. 
like and and busy and you know like it wasn't like one of those places with three girls no broken down you know no. in a, and a marine with a no. hard on and four dollars <laughs> you know it, it was like you know you did the thing with the raining yeah you you make it right you do that to the stage I, I personally I, that's not my thing I do it to the girls on stage I'm not like, I, no I, not to me <laughs> to me making it rain as a guy while you're sitting or standing there is one of the most homoerotic things you can do because. The money is a, you're throwing the money for other guys to look at you. That isn't about the girl. So I tend not to be a money thrower. I just I just tally you up at the end. What you yeah. you you got a stack of singles like this? Yeah, you I do that. But oh. the girls that are on stage, I'll throw money at them because oh, so when a girl is on stage, that's her. That's us on stage. That's her. And the way you give her applause or laughs is to throw money up there, and it encourages other people to throw money. So you do that because it's a tribute to her. It's like some goddess worship shit from 10,000 years ago. But if a girl is giving me a lap dance, a lap dance is a $5 a piece, I just want you to grind in my lap for an hour. I'll tally, I'll tally you up at the end. <laughs> just act like you love me, baby. I, I, I mean, just, first of all, you know, I love your wife. Yes, I, <laughs> I just do. How can you not? And like, driving through that neighborhood, it's funny. From the East Coast, when we think of a bad neighborhood, you know, I'm from... New Jersey, yeah. New York, yeah. you know, we had, certainly were within spitting distance of bad neighborhoods um, where, you know, you were in Central Park, you know, Johnny Carson used to do jokes about the crime in Central yeah. Park every fucking night. It was fun, fun, fun city, you know. So, uh, but in the East Coast, a bad neighborhood, it's like an urban setting. Yeah. So it's, it looks bad. It's grimy. Yeah. Buildings. Yeah. You know, dark streets. It's not a bad name. But like, I remember I saw Boys in the Hood. Yeah. And that was it was California. Yeah. And I was like, wait, that looks like the where I grew up. It looks like, like a high, yeah. You know, why is this a bad neighborhood? And and that and it didn't look like a bad neighborhood to me. Because it's not. But okay, so the driver did not want to go there. Yeah. Um, he was scared when he got out. Um, you know, I must say, you know, you're the king of Atlanta. I don't know. I think so T.I., I, 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 I let T.I. keep the key. I, well, I, I, you know I am? I'm, I'm, I'm an unofficial... Well, you're a prince. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're a prince of the city. I don't know what, what you are. A princeling. Something in the royal family. But some pe I did see some hard looks. Some people looked at me like, you don't belong here. And then they realized who you were, though. And it was like, oh, oh, oh. No, that didn't make any difference. No, no, no. I, no, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> but you got to understand. Wait, you got to understand. Usually if a white guy's in there, he's in a trucker's hat. <laughs> and he's in a <laughs> denim coat. And it's the day because there's a truck stop across. So oh. the confused looks you get weren't about who are you? We don't want you here. Oh. It was who the fuck's the white guy at night? Because usually, <laughs> usually you would be there and you would be a southern white man driving a truck and you would have walked from the truck stop across the street. But at night in a suit, they were trying to figure out who the fuck is this white? And then they were like, oh my fucking God, Mike got blue oh, oh. And then I had to tell everybody, okay. don't take pictures and don't shout them out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember saying to your wife, you know, she's like, the girls, like, I felt like I was in a cartoon. Yeah, I don't like I, I mean, the largeness of the yeah. tits and ass. Now that was now now a lot of the tits and ass we saw that night was was it was like it was Bondo to a car. Like a lot of that was. No disrespect to the girls, but a lot of that. What? You know how you can have a car that's made of metal? You get in a wreck, you can have it repaired with metal, you can have Bond open on it. So a lot of girls fly down to Dominican Republic or places like Miami or Colombia. They get a little Bondo. Right. right. You know? And it's kind of turned into a look. But the girl that ended up dancing for you had a beautiful body. She was. Yes. Yeah. She was natural, all natural. She's one of my favorite dancers. <laughs> People, it's crazy as I say this to women and they're looking at me like, you fucking pervert. What do you mean your favorite dancer? I'm like, because dancers are entertainers. Like, she, yes. she, she's my speed of entertainment. I can't, I can't, I don't need an ass right, as big as my belt. Also, what's interesting about that club is that the girls, like, there's no, like, uh, <laughs> would you like a dance? They just start. Dance. Right. I mean, they well, work, that's, they that's work like, hard for the money. Yeah, they do. So hard for it, honey. Yeah. So you better <laughs> not, <treat> her, whatever. <laughs> you better <laughs> treat her right. Oh, you better treat her right. <laughs> better not fuck with her. You, though, oh. I can, can say handled yourself pro as fuck. You were chill. <laughs> <laughs> you like I was like, why doesn't he let the girls oh, You were like, no, well, you I don't know, you were like, that's enough. Again, your wife was so funny. She's like, it's all about, you know, you with the singles and the throwing, and and she's like, come on, throw this. And I'm like, you know what? I can't do that. I cannot throw money at people. I'm sorry. It's just I know it's not <laughs> disrespectful in this setting. I just can't do it. And then 
um, the girl sat down. I said, "Just let's just talk for a second. I don't, you know, hello. How about, how about hello? Because I'm just killing a night with my buddy. I'm not looking for trouble or dating or, you know. So, um, you know, and I, I always, if I'm in that setting, the strip club setting, I will always, first of all, make it clear to the girl, I understand you're working. Yeah. And give her $100 right away. Yeah. Just I'll to say, talk. like, I, it's just a way to say, I respect that this is your job. Yeah. You know, you're not here to jerk me off or, you know, yeah. listen to my problems. Maybe that's it. I think sometimes they are therapists. Day shift girls are more problem listeners. Therapists. The girls who are day shift, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they tend to be nursing students and, and like, bullshit. <laughs> 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 Oh, is that what they tell you, Mike? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm nursing student. I mean, when you got to drop them off to school uh, the next day. Uh, <laughs> I've had some fun. But, I mean, and your wife, she looked up, she was like, she saw that $100 and she was like, because she had been trying to get me to throw the singles. And I just said, I do it my own way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you, you, but you wound up really spending well. like, a billion times more than I did. No, nah, I think I Oh, my God, that stack? <coughs> I maybe spent like, the grand. No. Because it was you. Really? Yeah, I maybe spent it. It was a stack. I, it was, it was, but even that is kind of a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, but... To be spending in a strip I used, club? I, used, I average about 400 bucks. I try to, I'm trying to make sure That's, uh, I have a couple hundred You know, it's, it's like playing poker. Yeah. You know you're going to lose it. It's just a fun activity when you're out. And you're helping the economy. I really do appreciate you bringing me into there. Oh. Into your world and um, and you know, all oh, with all that's going on in the country, I c couldn't help think that you know. Yes, we've made a lot of progress, but like when when you're on, I I yeah. have the staff print out the lyrics to your. I listen to the record. Oh, thank you. Of course. Yeah. But then I also want to read what? because I can't understand what any music, <laughs> not just you know, I don't understand the Bee Gees. Yeah. <laughs> Really? I mean, I, oh. I still don't under, know what the lyrics to Honky Tonk Women are. <laughs> I met her in a room and then I'm all, all lost. Is just I, I, so, I don't feel so bad. No, but I want to read it, okay. you know, because there's so much slang. Well, a lot of well, and, and references, and, right? Rappers, man, our grand dilemma is for people who are considered dangerous and illiterate, we sure have to have a mastery of words. Like, That's what I'm trying to I say to you. You're, you're guess, speaking two languages, you know. T.I. is especially great with words. Uh, not just the rap words. Like he, oh, well. I just hung up from our high school principal, who's 70-something's birthday today. Shouts out to Dr. Hill. But Tip sounds like Dr. Hill to me. When I close my eyes, like, you know, enthusiastically and porically, like, you just hear these words like, Fuck, you were selling cocaine. How did you learn these well, words as a crack dealer? Just the sheer <laughs> volume. If you print out a pop song, uh, uh, you know, anything before 16 rap. 16 words, yeah, the whole song. I, I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it, it, it feels like half a page. And yeah. very often I've heard the Beatles talk about this and say, uh, you know, if we couldn't think of a third verse, we'd just repeat the first one. Yeah. Like you can't, it, yeah. like they came up with like eight lines yeah. and they were fucking totally cooked on yeah. that. And yeah. so they just said, and we don't care. But rap, it's like it would be each song's like two pages. It's getting shorter though, but yeah, you're like, right. Like fully typed and like yeah. lots and lots of verses and they're all clever and you know, I mean, it's just, it's not really comparable. I mean, there are great, of course, pop yeah. lyrics, uh, you know, I mean, Paul Simon is a great lyricist yes. and Dylan and sometimes uh, Lennon McCartney, but not like really, some of them, there's a few people on that kind of level where you could almost read it as poetry. Yeah. Absolutely. But your stuff, you could always read his poetry. Yeah, it's kind of, because, you know, rap is a, it's, it's a weird little hybrid. Um, you know, it's kids who, did, who weren't necessarily been given the best opportunity from an educational standpoint, but because you had these fringe groups that were, you know, you had like the last poets, Gil Scott, you had um, out of jazz, you know, the, the scat and the beat of bop, and you had story tales of people like Stagger Lee from the early 1900s. So, um, if you look at Muddy Waters, Reef and Champagne, that song, it sets up for what would later become rap lyrics. Because in the blues, you're just kind of testifying how crazy and fucked up and my life and heart is. I think rap kind of did that. And, and James Brown, oh, was, is that a, isn't that yeah, a kind absolutely. of a bridge? I think one of the most sampled, if he, he used to be the most sampled artist in terms of taking his break, the break beats, the, what the music that would play in between the verses and stuff, or yeah. to, to give him a break. Do it take those, man. Those are have created 
public enemies, right. you know, the cornerstone, what 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 um Funkadelic did and the West Coast kind of teetering their sound on that is it's been made. Curtis Mayfield really as a Curtis Mayfield's my favorite. My mom had me when she was 16 years old. And she got married to my non-bio dad. So I got two dads. I'm lucky. She got me two great guys as dads. Wow. Um, when she got married, when she was 19 and moved out, she, my grandmother was just like, go learn how to be somebody's wife. Don't, don't worry about him. We're going to, her and my grandpa, we're going to raise him. Mm. And my mom left me these records. So was, I'm, I'm a young kid, but I get to play Curtis Mayfield. And Mayfield's lyrics, the music, the stories all pull me in. And to the point where I start to, to get, like, one to rap over the stuff. And you got artists that came out of the South, like Evol, yeah. MJG, and Outkast that use that sound. So rap, to me, is a progression of, of wailing from the church, of blues, from the juke joints, of, of jazz and the, and the, and the speakeasies. It, we are a combination of that and the Caribbean art of DJing and party throwing that Cool Hurt kind of brought over. And then it got to the South and just became this hybrid with the music we already like. So Curtis Mayfield. Yes. I think I think I have a few of his. Is that Pusher Man? That's Pusher Man. That's Superfly soundtrack. That's super. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That I can now that you mention it, I wouldn't have noticed. But I mean, I've had that in my. You know, I use the old iPod. Yeah. Did I tell <laughs> the, you that thick one? The, with the circle. Yeah, the thick. And I will maintain until I die. It's, it's what? How so? You use it for paperweight? It still works. Like you have to get them on eBay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really, but there, it's a, you know, you can do things on them you can't do. Just controlling, it's like, I want my records. I feel Even if, you know what I mean? If you've been on a video conference recently, you know that the experience can be awful. Slow video, people cutting out, and the worst part, trying to pretend to your boss that you give a shit about your job. That's where SignalWire comes in. SignalWire is a technology arsenal that allows developers to create better real-time video communication apps quickly because that's what we need, more apps. SignalWire empowers developers to create more natural, real-time interactive experiences. And SignalWire provides developer-friendly APIs and SDKs to help you get your app up and running with a few clicks and a snippet of code instead of months of complex development work. It's been the choice of TV and film studios for remote looping and audio recording because it does what other video tech simply can't do. Visit SignalWire.com slash random to sign up for a free account and receive an additional 5,000 video minutes for testing your app or integration. Go to SignalWire.com slash random. Get communications APIs from the OGs of software-defined telecom at SignalWire. Go to SignalWire.com slash random today. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website you visit? And what's worse is they can sell this information to companies who will use your data to target you and alert you that there is a woman in your area who is quite horny and may be willing to come to your house right now. ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. ExpressVPN works on everything, phones, laptops, even routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can still be protected even if they don't have ExpressVPN. And the best part is, using ExpressVPN is easier than that woman in your area. You just fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. So if you're like me and believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash random today. Use my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash random, and you can get an extra three months free. That's expressvpn.com slash random. Is she going to have anything in there to like... No, nah, I'm, I'm going to just stick with just the whiskey. Soften the blow. <laughs> just the <laughs> Soften the blow. Well, I'm very, so you were I'm alive in the blow. Very flattered. You're you're spending you. one of your few drinking nights. You are a friend Thank and brother. Thank you. Tonight. I appreciate you. Yes. You were alive in the blow era. Yes. What the fuck was that like? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been waiting to talk. It was, a, it was a lot like that. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. So as most things, <laughs> I was late and missed it. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that explains why you're still here. I always wanted to ask that. But, uh, like, when it was over, I did, there was a period where I did, like, 
have a little flirtation with cocaine for a year or so, and it was like so not me because it's not me. I'm like a pothead. Yeah, it was a low point, but I was never like uh, crazy. You know, I mean, it wasn't like yeah, it was a flirtation, and then I was like, no, this sucked. I always thought it sucked, and I was right. And ugh, but in the '80s, I mean, I've only heard these stories, but like. It was so, like early 80s, it was so commonplace and thought to be sort of benign that people would break it out in business meetings. Well, Like, uh, yes. I mean, Richard Pryor famously, and they can't all be lying. I mean, you just <laughs> ask Mel Brooks, because he's still very sharp and still here. I'm sure he would remember, uh, like Blazing Saddles, they were riding it together. And, you know, they would just break out a big rock and bounce it on the table. And this is the good shit. This and is not the shit I'm that got sure. all night. This and that was a writing session. You know, you know these, these people were... They were know, living. Yes. Hey, but, but it just, it sort of didn't dawn on people that it was bad for a while. I don't know. They were high. Well, black people and don't do as well with cocaine. Like, there's an opportunity because my mom was only 16 years older than me. But I lived with my grandparents. Her house was like our weekend retreat, me and my sisters. And her house was kind of like your basement at, at 6 o'clock Friday. It just became a club. Really? And the, yeah, the, and the, because my mom was a florist, so she was with interior designers, artists, and it was, it was like a this bohemian ass living room in this middle class black neighborhood. Cause she lived further out in Decatur, where like ex Braves pitcher Phil Negro and shit lived. So mom was doing pretty good, you know. <laughs> Phil Negro, quite a reference. I, hey man, he played for the Braves, bro. <laughs> yes, he did, and he lived there. Yeah, he lived out in Decatur at the time. Boy, yeah. that's really throwing me a knuckleball on yeah, that. Yeah, then huh? white flight happened, and that's when I, I wonder where all our white neighbors went. On uh, uh, white one, there were two white brothers I played with next door to my mom. And I came home one day; they were just gone. I was like, damn. What the fuck happened to the homies? Then I found out later about white flight. And I was like, the homies probably had to grow up in Forsyth. That was not lit. But oh. cocaine was something that I saw, not in a fucked up or foul or crazy way. It was just a bunch of young, artsy people running around my mom's house, coked up, free basing, having fun, partying, dancing all weekend and shit. And then I noticed, like, her white friends were still able to kind of get up and go to work on Mondays. I was like, <laughs> all the black folks are... <laughs> it's not, they're still here, Mom. This is not going as well for them. And that's when I, I said cocaine probably shouldn't be something. No, it's, it's, it is, that is the worst. I said, uh, like, a little while ago. And for was, you white was, coke users, you guys turn into assholes when you do it, so don't think it escapes that. Like, you know, it's, I, I hate that 3 o'clock in the morning call from your cokehead oh, white homie who's oh, just like, man, I want to fucking kill myself. Really? Oh, yeah, what the fuck is you? Up? Man, I'm sitting outside, man, my girl's in there, man. I think she called a call. Oh, my, ho, ho, ho. She's not dead, is she? No. I'm like, okay, okay, we can continue this conversation. But why were you friends with a guy like that? I mean, no, because you're a musician, and you're oh. friends even if you, you know, even if you aren't the closest of friends, you I just see. you form friendships. Of course. Yeah, and then and then your friend who's so, an amazing. That's the way you think of me, is it? No, you're, <laughs> you're, I you're, promise you, comedians. Are I, the, I will never call you up in the middle of the night <laughs> and be saying that. First of all, I'm just too old. But I just can't happen at this point, which is you know kind of a relief. No, I'm, I just, I don't think Coke is good for That's oh, just Coke, a mess yes. of black folks, yeah. But the Coke era, Coke. that era was why You guys had to have been having all the... See, I'm a celebrity in a very safe era. You, you can't say crazy shit to women. Um, sex, oh, safe right. sex is... I think oh. about my whole sexual career has been condoms for us. You know what I mean? We don't, we didn't get the, we didn't get the fun of raw dog and this shit. Like, you guys had, you were the last great era. You, you, my parents' era, yeah. your era was the last great era, you dog. I don't think a lot of people are having sex... Raw dog at this well, point. I mean, now you know they kind of fell back on it, but my we were scared as I shit. I think when all I was young people do the same thing. I'm sure I did it too. Yeah. Which is you know, the first time you're with somebody, you're like, we don't know each other. We need to use a condom, and then after you fuck them once, you're like, well, I know you now. <laughs> <laughs> Now that we know each other so well and we're such good friends, I don't know what. Woo! After all this time the, of the, an hour, the plan uh, B is we're, we're, we're doing. I still <laughs> using condoms plainly. We have a bond. <laughs> <laughs> Only Damon and Pythias were closer than we are. Uh -huh. What is your your name? And you know, and, and but yes, Coke kids, whoever's. Don't, do that. don't. That is worse than liquor because at least liquor is somewhat watched over. We know the ingredients are poison. Yeah. But Coke, they can put anything in it, and they do. 
it's never, I would love to know what pure cocaine is like, because I don't think it's like the drug we did in America. Nah, I don't, cause, yeah, because the, the shit over here, like by the time we as little kids start selling coke in terms of like trapping, what, what T.I. introduced the world to trap music, that was just whatever cocaine was supposed to be in a bunch of baby laxatives. <laughs> baby, <laughs> yes, baby laxatives, <laughs> which is why I used to put my diapers. <laughs> <laughs> Baby likes it if you're lucky. And then when you get to drugs like acid, Timothy Leary himself, you know who that is, right? No, who's Timothy Leary? Okay, he was the guy who introduced acid in the 60s. Okay. He was a, he I was don't a, know who you a Harvard about. professor. Yes. Who, he said, tune in, turn on, yeah. drop I've out. seen that picture of him with that quote. Yes, yeah. he was a, a, quite a counterculture hero to many, but, you know, did some sketchy things, I think. But I knew him at the end of his life. He was a lot of fun and a wise, you know, I mean, he was, he was onto something and there hasn't been acid, what he did as acid, since almost the 60s. He said there was this one batch made by this one guy, it's very hard to make, Owlsley, I think, was the, and like the one the Beatles and Dylan and everybody yeah. did in the 60s, said the, you know, because a jar of it was like thousands of hits, it's one drop, yeah. you know, acid. And he said, whatever you think is acid, it's just what somebody made. It's speed plus some, you know, ketamine or whatever. Yeah. I don't know what. See, that's why I never bought into the idea. No, did a, it's I did terrible. A, I think this kid's name might have been Steve. I took Washington High. So I went to Frederick Douglass, but I took driver's ed at Washington. He was looking for weed and couldn't get weed at whatever part of North Fulton he lived. It was easy for me to get weed in my neighborhood. And then he started telling me about what they were doing. I said, so what the fuck, you know, y'all doing up there? He, they were doing acid shit like that, and he had told me about this kid who had, was a skater, and that skated with a bunch of what was stamps or tabs in his back pocket, and potentially, he would, from what the story said, soaked into him, say the kid got all fucked up, thought he was an orange, and they, they had to fucking commit him. Oh. That's, that was all I needed to hear. I was like, yeah, I'm never doing that shit. But I was like, oh, cool. Oh, after, after alcohol made me sick in the McDonald's parking lot, oh. I was like, this ain't for me. I didn't smoke weed at first because, you know, I tried it with my friends. I smoked a little in high school just to be cool with the homies, but I didn't smoke weed or become a stoner until I smoked with Big Boy. When they were, when Outkast was recording. Oh, man. All right, they're from your... He, uh, right. they, yeah, they put they're me on, they changed my life, him and Dre, you know, and DJ Swift, oh. like, they changed my life. This, this guy... Is that right? They, they, they were mentors me, to you when, yeah. you when you were coming up? That's gave me my first yeah. record. I was Big Boy's right. little brother's James and oh. his best friend CeeLo's punk-ass punk homeboy. Because I remember was, when they were the <laughs> biggest. Man, and then and then and they all just, of music. Yes. Yeah. They, they, yeah. And then ten years ago, they won an album of the year. You got rappers arguing about even being nominated for I mean, album of the year now. They made. You know, Mrs. They, Jackson Mrs. was Jackson. like a very big crossover, yeah. like a maybe the biggest record of that year. That one, that one was so dope and so good and so poignant and, and hard. like every baby's father in the world fell down. Oh, so are you still though. friendly with them? You still see yeah, them? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, they're like, like you know, when you, when I say someone or call someone brother, you know, even if I haven't talked to you in 20 years, like, I still see you or view you that way. And we happen to talk. Big and I talk very often, as we're still in the same city. Dre and I talk often. So Dre is out here making movies, and mm. um, he plays the flute now, and he does some other cool shit. He's rich as fuck. Yeah. He, they're what I call white folks rich. So it ain't like they got to be on the scene <laughs> at the... You know, I got big to go to the flame with me last year, though. That was fun. Oh. That was fun as fuck. I, well, I, uh, you know, anytime you need a wingman. I got you. I think, you they know. Act, they ask about you. Well, who does? The, the, I'm from the owners to the girls. The DJ. Like, <laughs> really? Yeah, it means something, man. You oh. know, you coming through there meant something. Oh. Well, I mean, it was the funnest time ever. I took a and couple of athletes by there. Who are, who are, you know, the teams tell them, don't go in that kind of shit. I get them in the back door, let them have a good time, let them see. You know, it's just a black neighborhood. It's just it's just, it's just a regular middle class black I, neighborhood. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> it's like Tony, if you I, watch Tony Soprano, it's it's like it's like the Bada B. Like, it's just like it's the right. neighborhood spot. Exactly. That's, like, that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. And the guys who own it, not even gangsters. You know? So that's the beautiful part. People just can't help themselves from just making stupid shit out of, I mean, is it just? It's like when people try right. to say to black people in Atlanta, you guys don't, you aren't afraid to go to Stone Mountain? 
And we're like, where there's a 95% black. <laughs> Stone Mountain is that 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 mountain that um, it's a oh. mountain, it's the hill that they have the Confederate generals carved in. <laughs> right? Of course, Stone now, Mountain. Yeah. Now, now, it used to be uh, a predominantly white enclave. You know, I'm sure some people who had had lineage all the way back to Confederacy. Now it's just a bunch of black people. Right. But not just regular black folks. Immigration from across the world. The diaspora is there. East Africans there. Caribbeans are there. West Africans are there. High Indian populace. You got all these people. It's one of the most diverse cities in Georgia. So when people ask Atlanta, it's like, you are as afraid. But what the fuck are we going to see? Our cousins? Right. <laughs> from, you know, from... from, from and, the- and the people there, I'm guessing, correct me if I'm wrong, I might be, I'm guessing that the people there look at the mountain, or have seen it, and are like, yeah, that's wrong, and what's for dinner? Yeah. You know, like, okay. Yeah, well, I, I mean, if they, I mean, what would they do? They would demolition the, <laughs> it's hard to take I've, down I've a, heard people, you take down a statue, but it's hard to take down a mountain. Yeah, I've heard people, I've heard, like, now there is a running suggestion from Butter ATL, shots out to that website. They're really cool, this kid named Brandon started it. There's a there's a there's a push to put outcast on the side of it and like usher. <laughs> That's now, what you do. Just, just change the features. That, just get, <laughs> that would be to, to see yeah. Dre uh, as Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> That'd be amazing. I honestly just man, I'm more concerned with the you know the next twenty years of city contracts and making sure some black contractors can get it. That's what you know. I'd like to see a guy named Omar Ali get more contracts than I would necessarily. Care to yeah. argue over? Am I practical scared to go? Because yeah. the practical hey, shit changes shit. Have you ever seen or been to Mount Rushmore? No, I've not done by Mount <laughs> Well, not so. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Jesus. No, I would be. I'd be upset if you had. Uh, been to Yellowstone and um, the Grand Canyon, though. But I have. So, what'd you think? It was so interesting. I was doing a HBO special that year. It was 1995. And it was in Minnesota, and I wanted to go somewhere with my girlfriend at the time after, and we took a little vacation to the heartland because we thought it was corny, too. And it was, but it was also sort of, like, sweet in a way. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, Mount Rushmore, I was just thinking, if they even tried to do it today, now, of course, it's pointless. Yeah. There's no reason to do it in the first place. Let's, let's put that right on the table. But... The fact that in the Depression, they were able to, like, muster the amount of organizational skill, courage, and, uh, you know, engineering, and get it done in a a reasonable amount of years. If we tried to do that now, uh, the budget would go to $16 billion. You get halfway through Lincoln's nose, and they would uh, pull the plug on the project (laughs) because of all the graft. And I'm always talking about this on my show. The, the, it just bugs me so much that we can't get anything done because everything, every pig at the trough has to take so much. You know, Everybody has to get their beak wet to the point where nothing can get done. Yeah, just, yeah. And it costs like 10 times more than what it does in France yeah. to build a bridge or a highway. Whenever you look for news, you may feel forced to choose between echo chambers and mainstream media and conspiracy-obsessed alternative media. That's why you should check out The Lost Debate. It's a podcast and YouTube show for political eclectics who want to escape their media bubbles and engage in good faith with ideas from across the political spectrum. Hey, sounds kind of familiar. The Lost Debate is hosted by Ravi Gupta, a former staffer for Obama and school principal, Corey Bradford, a political organizer from the Deep South turned TikTok star who once hosted a Fox News radio show, and Ricky Schlott, a Gen Z New York Post columnist and libertarian fighting to protect free speech. They cover the latest news, ideas, and trends that mainstream media overlooks, and they focus on bringing new perspectives to the table in constructive debates that sound less like crossfire and more like discussions between real people. Join the conversation. Check out The Lost Debate today. New episodes drop twice a week. Find The Lost Debate on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. Did you know HBO Max had podcasts? I'm on my podcast talking about the podcasts on my network. This must be what the metaverse feels like. 
Now go even deeper inside your favorite shows with audio companions to some of the most groundbreaking and award-winning shows on television. Listen to the official companion podcast for the HBO original limited series, We Own This City. Host D. Watkins dives into his experiences in Baltimore and in the writer's room and speaks to the people who brought this story to the screen. Like the show, the podcast focuses on the rampant corruption and abuse within Baltimore's criminal justice system. Watkins is joined by a variety of guests, including executive producers George Pelicanos and David Simon of The Wire, actors John Bernthal and Wunmi Musaku, as well as notable figures whose stories inspired the series. You can listen to the We Own This City podcast on HBO Max and on all major podcast platforms. So my mom and you were in the same age demographic, but she was a cool girl. She did floral arrangements, these beautiful trees and flowers and shit, and she would um, she would she would go to she was partnered with a white woman up in Cobb County back when it you know was it wasn't the Braves weren't there. Let's just say wasn't safe just going through Cobb County. Too to do to do as a black person. But she had a business with this woman, and the women started asking her for coke. And before you know it, my mother was a drug trafficker, and a pretty successful one and good one, and introduced me, Roxanne Shante, the man, the first generation, one of the dopest female rappers and rappers ever. My mom was, was going to New York to, to you know, party and hang, probably to do deals, and met Roxanne Shante right before she went upstate, I think, who had come up from a foster care facility, and she gave me a signed picture of her. That was just a real picture, not like a mm. headshot and a record. And I told her that. And when they premiered a movie, I mean, she cried like fuck. Shit, I, oh. She cried, I cried. I was like, man, wow. all drug dealers ain't bad. My mom, no, of course <laughs> not. My mom, wow. but your gener so your generation, I, I, I hate that you guys are losing hope because you were the hope field. It's because I had this cool ass young mother who was willing to, I told her I wanted to be a rapper at night. She was like, yeah, fuck it. You can be a fucking rapper. Let's really? do it. We're gonna, you're gonna go to the Fresh Fest. We're gonna, and man, I we've lost that hope. Like I, you know, it, it's like So your mother encouraged you. That's absolutely. awesome. Because usually when kids say something about going into show business, it's like, oh, let's hope it's a phase. He gets <laughs> over and then he comes to his senses and will sell Kenny shoes for the rest of his life. That is what makes a person sense yeah. something, you know. <laughs> that was my bio dad. Like Whereas, like, when I was uh, thinking about becoming a comedian, that's all I was doing, thinking about it. Because I was too afraid to say it out loud to anybody. I thought, first of all, you, unless you are a comedian, you're just going to be mocked. Mm -hmm. I remember one, uh, the first year of <laughs> my post-college life, and I was living in New York in a shitbox, and uh, was home for Christmas, and at one point I had to, my parents were like, well, you're out of college and you haven't told us what you do, you know, because uh, I didn't ask for, you know, I was very prideful. Yeah. You know, uh, so no money. I was, I was selling pot. Yeah. Uh, that was how That's I was getting by. Oh, college. of course. Gotcha. College and the first couple of years as a comedian. I mean, that was essential to my. That's beautiful. You know, not that kids should try it that way. Anyway. Well, it's legal, so it's legal now. You, yes, so legal. Do it a completely legal. Oh, absolutely. Man, it's good to know oh, yeah. I'm in the league. It's a, it's a small oh, yes. fraternity. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I mean, I had, thank God for that to keep me afloat. You, you, know, you, when, you have a drug dealer's wit about you, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, by the time you get to the end of the evening, the dealer's seen it all. You know, your fucking weed joke isn't as funny as the first one here. So you got what? that about you. Like, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. Give me, give me my hundred bucks. Here's your ounce. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> this looks like. No, it wasn't hard uh, to get customers. I mean, college kids, come on. And then uh, comedians. Like, being in the club was perfect. Yes. Like, you know, the bass player in the house band was a good customer. And uh, the aforementioned Richard Belzer still owes me about $1,200. Let's pay him, Rich. Don't okay. be a dick. Let's get him. Let's, <laughs> let's get okay. this man paid. Richard Belzer, such a magnificent comedian and was a mentor to me. Yeah. Like, he, he was like the big act when I got there, and he kind of tucked me under. Y'all are a real community. I've, I've realized. Yes. Some, so I got to shout out, like, Ryan Davis is a brilliant young comedian coming up. And Ryan is my friend. I met him, I, I found him on Instagram, followed him, and we just built the friendship. Like, Ryan comes to Atlanta, he come to my house, stay as long as he needs to. But this motherfucker has walked me 
like into between him and my friendship with Dave Chappelle. I've gotten a chance to kind of be in y'all's community, just kind of shut the fuck up in the corner. And be quiet. You guys are an amazing community in terms of willingness uh, to, to help one another, teach, learn. And you, unlike rappers, you know, rappers make a song, it's the best fucking record. Fuck you mean you don't like my shit. You know, and, and, you, and the whole time on the inside, you're like, man, goddamn, this, this, this shit. But you guys put your insecurities out with yourself in front of other people. I told Ryan, I said, man, I want to do that shit. He's like, if you come to my show, nigga, I'm going to put you on stage. And I'm like, nah. He's like, nah, I'm for real. And he put me on stage. I did 11 minutes. I said, what you think after? He said, you funny. You should have did five. Right? So, so I'm like, okay, I got a goal of five. But Tip recently took up comedy. T.I. And started doing it. And it's, Is that it's, right? Yeah. And, and your oh, community, this, the comedic community, has really shown a lot of love to rappers that have, that have popped. And it's, it's, it's not like we right. think you're going to ever be right. you, you guys. You told me this in Atlanta. Remember? And I said... I think, first of all, you're a natural. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and that you should do it. And just tell me how I can help. Yeah. Because, like... I'm going to get a shit a try. Uh, I kid, you know, from Kid and Play, you know, Chris, right? Mm-hmm. He was... Uh, I kind of started him in... Because I could tell he's, you know, hysterical. They were. And he has made a great living. You know, Kid and Play actually play a lot of dates now, too. Yes. But there was a time when they were kind of wandering in the wilderness and... You know, he's a fantastic comedian. He was on my Hawaii tour this year. And, uh, you know, because the same thing with rappers, you know. Sometimes people aren't professional comedians, but you go, oh, they could be. Yeah. There's a couple of actors that way, like Tom Hanks is not a stand-up comedian, but he could be. Gotcha. You know, Michael gotcha. Keaton was. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you can kind of see that. But you can tell when people, like some actors who just... Or some singers, they're just mouthing the words. Not mouthing, they yeah. feel, they emote, but they, they can't, they're not like, you know, so a lot of performers are just, it's very, their intelligence is very artistic and instinctive, but I feel like rappers and comics has to be a lot going on up there. It may not be savory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but something, <laughs> and there, there's dumb comics too, and I'm sure dumb rappers, but, you know, basically, you know, there, there's uh, a lot of, uh, energy that you have to access something with and we make it our art. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's right. I mean, how do I, how have I always from the beginning written material by doing this? I yes. never once or maybe once tried to sit with yeah, a no, yellow <laughs> pad and purposely, it's like, no, what comes out <laughs> when I'm like doing this <laughs> with my friends? <laughs> Luckily I'll remember something, some of it that was good. Yeah. You know, if I had a nickel for every, like, good one I left on the floor because oh. I was like, oh, I remember that. And the next day, like, ah, oh, fuck, what were we talking about? Yeah. Outcast but, DJ is like that. DJ Cutmaster Swift. Swift is, Swift was born a comedian. I pray, I pray that, I'm just like, any show I book that's near where I can put you as a co-host or anything, you're going to be there. Let's he, put together a comic rap super show. I do it. In a heartbeat. I do it. Right? And you can do, yeah, you can do time, you know, comic time, and then that would be actually a pretty good show. I have to figure that out. Or we're very high. And it's like, <laughs> I it could, could be that. I it's know like, what cities I could yeah, pull it off in. Tampa, know. Jacksonville, Atlanta. Let's be astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> and let's do it on the moon. Let's have a comic rap show on, on the, the moon. moon. Shaquille It'll, O'Neal will help promote it. And let's... Watch that documentary on the fire festival first because we don't want to get up to the moon and there's no toilet. <sighs> Why haven't you done a, a cartoon yet? A cartoon? Yeah, man. You for the for the venom you have for children, you'd be an amazing. Cartoon. I do not have venom for children. Well, you you, you don't <laughs> have a lot of I care to involve myself with. Oh, them. that's I totally know. true. Yeah, I want them up. nowhere near me. That's, <laughs> that's absolutely right. That would qualify. But, that, but that's not venom. <laughs> that's, that's just I personal. Want them nowhere near me. <laughs> That's just not venom, Mike. That's personal taste. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, I mean, how are your kids? That's what I meant to ask. My you. children are. To... <laughs> I, my children are great. My cho- I have. I have a. How I, are the kids, they're, Mike? They're, they're great. That my kids let me know that hey, man, y- y- your kids get all of your personality, not just the parts you like. No, how old are they? I have a twenty-seven-year-old boy named Malik. I have a twenty-four-year-old daughter named Anaya. 
I have a 19-year-old boy named Pony Boy who we're waiting a kidney for. So you guys oh. make sure that you're donating kidneys out there. He's um, on dialysis and oh. just a trooper. He calls to check on me. I was scared as hell, that, you know, how it would affect him psychology. I mean, from a psychological standpoint. And then I realized he was still smoking weed and banging chicks for a while. And I had to say, oh, no, you can't. Oh. You, can, you can bang, but you can't be smoking weed, son. But he, um, oh, he's, he's good. And he has a 14-year-old sister who played her first year of JV ball, and we all cheered for her and talked shit to, you know? Wow. Yeah. So 27 to 14. Yep. I started as a kid. I should not have been having children. Do not have children with teen. I, I, that's what you're <laughs> talking. Yeah. I, I mean, but, but, you know, I feel like... When are you going to do it? Like, I, me and Shana talking about it. it. You got to do it. Oh, sweetheart. You got to at least do, like, the rich white Hollywood people thinking, like, adopt a black child. Sweetheart, if I had a... If I got someone pregnant tonight, yeah, and I'm going to try. No, yes. uh, but I, I, I mean, the, I, I'd be like 82 when the kid got out of high school or something. I said, you don't ever get compelled to like just go like adopt a, a kid, like a like just man, fuck it, I'd have a good life. You know? uh, no, I, it would have hit me by now. <laughs> I'm 66. I, I mean, and by the way, in life, you see, as you're old enough to know. You travel down the path of life. Yeah. Some things change radically, and yeah. you're, there are turns in your life, right? With this one, me and not liking kids, it is a steady line, like... All the way through it. It no. is... It's as flat as the earth, according to... Okay, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish more... I wish more... I tell my children, and I tell my boys in particular... Don't have kids. I, we, we, I had a good run. We've done. And my girls, just, they laugh. You know? I didn't like kids when I was a kid. Yeah. Really? I didn't watch cartoons. I thought cartoons were childish when I was like... Really? Yes. I've heard you say that about comic books. I would only... Comic books, also stupid. I would never read them. I would only watch filmed shows like Superman yeah. or The Three Stooges. That, I felt, was up to my level of okay. sophistication when I was five. I took it but all. Car cartoons, my friends still make fun of me. They, like, mention some cartoon character. I'll be like, Bill, who's, you know, I don't know. The crazy shit about Daffy cartoons Daffy Duck. Is and I'm like, uh, he's a duck. I know that. And that's it. That. You, could, you could get so much more in with a cartoon. I, as a kid, I liked cartoons. I like, well, Family Guy. You, we, <laughs> my boyfriend's at but, but he, Before you get there, like, Genius. there were things that Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain could do. That regular TV can't couldn't do at the time and can't do now in terms of the the messages they could say. You remember was, Aaron Magruder? I, I talked to Aaron two days ago. Hopefully, I'll get to see him while I'm out here. Yeah, I remember. I mean, so so Boondocks. My um, Brad Boyd, who's a former Fulton County prosecutor and later a judge that really helped a lot of kids get their their life straight. Brad is a friend and mentor of mine since I was like 15. Wow. Brad comes in. We, I was sat on a board. I was on a, the, the children's section of a board called the Atlanta Foods Commission on Children and Youth. And Brad and I sat on the same board together. And Brad brought a newspaper in because he would come to our Thursday meetings. So the other adults saw us once a month or, or a quarter. Brad would see me every Thursday. We really built a great relationship. And he said, he put a piece of paper. And he said, tell me what you think of this. And he brought it in, you know, the next couple of weeks. And, I, and before you know it, I was hooked on it. And I was telling Aaron that I recognized that mm. the people who read the paper, the strip, the comic strip, like you may have read the comic strip, were different from the audience that watched the TV show. And he was talking about how mm. times have changed and and just like like how people don't understand. You can't just slap that show back on television. Just right. some nuance you have to rethink. <laughs> it was amazing to me how much thought he puts into it and how much he cares. And I've seen this like resurgence of it. Like my 14-year-old knows the show and now wears the hoodies. Now they're selling, you know, right. you go to... Anywhere place you can buy Nikes, oh, you can was, buy Boondocks. It was it's state of the art. Yeah, it's crazy. Right. It's, so cartoons, I think, have the potential, which is why, like my my non-bio dad introduced me. My dad was a police officer for a short time, but he was built to be that. Like he struck. He really right. should have went in military, but you know he had children at nineteen. He shouldn't have had me at nineteen. He should have went. He would have made a great soldier, but he's very structured. He had to be. His dad. His dad died when he was ten. My non-bio dad. His dad lived until I was in the second grade. My grandpa was the one who worked for, for Hall Steel. His dad allowed his boys just to be college boys. 
So my dad was into fucking toy cars, puzzles, comics. And it was because I had these two different kind of men in my life that gave me like a yin and a yang, mm. the, the real kind of heroic qualities that other kids would have to find in places that were unsavory, I had right there in front of me in the two guys. And my non-bio dad let me read comics. Now, when we went to the comic store, it was those seedy, like, 70s, 80s bookstores. So I'm in the comic section as dad's buying porn. He still gets some comic books, but I'm just like, oh, I was like, that's when you're getting the fucking Playboys. You know what I'm saying? So I, I really got a freedom of that, but I started to see the same type of morality play, talk that my grandmother would read you know, in the Bible, what the Samson and Delilah mean. It was kind of the same thing I was seeing in Poison Ivy and Batman. And I got, I started, as a kid, what I was able to do was kind of See what 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 that their commonalities in human literature in terms of love, hate, romance. That you type saw it thing. in there. I saw it in that. I saw it in comics early. You know? That's an interesting because I've heard people say things like that before. Yeah, you know. Um, I can understand how you'd miss it too. I, but, but you know, as a kid, that's what it. I just feel me. like it's appropriate when you're a kid. It's just <laughs> not appropriate when you're an adult because, like, like I've heard people. <laughs> Okay, like, yes, when you're a kid, but I've heard people say, like, because I got into trouble once, uh, you know, with Twitter and those people when I said blog or something about Stan Lee when he died, and it wasn't mean about Stan Lee. It was just saying, you know, aren't we making kind of a big deal about a guy who wrote comic books? And it was like, Bill, like 40,000 Twitter followers immediately dropped me, like more than for any other issue. So... uh, and they were like, Bill, you know, I learned everything about social justice from comic books. And I'm like, great, but now you have Everything. pubic hair. <laughs> you know, uh, read James Baldwin. You could yeah, do it, you, you know, you could do it in an adult way. One of my things, favorite you know? authors, too. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, the plot of The Godfather is resolved differently than the plot of a comic book movie. Yeah. It, not with people shooting rays no. out of the end of their finger. Yeah, yeah and, and so I can a... say I can't defend the movies as much. Logan, I thought was was incredible. I liked the and I liked the Last Avengers, but like the movies, the movies PG and dumbed down a lot of what I feel like the illustrated novels give you. Let me say that. And I didn't like all comics. I just liked you know well who who I liked. Also, you know what? I mean, there's like what do they call them now? There's some there's something that's like in between a comic book and a real book. With well, the illustrated novels. Is that what? It, okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure that they're more. I thought, I, yeah, they're more sophisticated than a comic book, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, and then some comic books, like you know, have always been a little more heady too. Method Man is a reader of comics and, a, and an expert. You should. You should. Everybody is, but me. I'm, I, I'm just, not. I'm not. You know, I don't. I don't go to like, Comic Con. I just. Feel like, like, I don't. But some I'm, things I'm, I just fucking feel like being snobby about, <laughs> and you all can kiss my ass. I mean, I don't, I don't really give a fuck either way about comic books <laughs> or who reads them, and you like them fine. <laughs> I do stupid things. <laughs> That's too. how I feel about reality television. I, I don't watch that either. Oh, no. Really? I just don't oh, give please. a shit. No. I don't give a fuck. No. And, I, and I feel kind Although, of crazy sometimes because... I have to amend that. There is a show that Which is... Which one? Oh, you'll, you're going to fucking want people. punch me. What? It's called Temptation Island. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've talked about it on my... On real time. Really. You don't escape it, though. You know that. I, I that part, that part of your brain that needs some ratchet shit. It's just you don't escape. It's, so temptation. I love it. It's like it's ninety good. day fiance or cheater. No, it's point. better than that. It's better. like ninety also, day fiance. I, I must say, funny. now this is a, like a you know, it's Mark Wahlberg. Okay, uh, not that one. The other. The, okay. He hosts it, and like I must say, for, for a job that is like, <laughs> like a step above playing piano in a whorehouse. <laughs> <laughs> he, oh, he, 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 he does it so well. He's a husker in a whorehouse. But he does it so well. I swear to God, there is a skill and an art to being the host of oh, yeah. Temptation Island. It could be done badly. So what <laughs> the fuck is happening on Temptation Island? Never get a Kennedy Center honor for this. I mean, uh, this is he will be overlooked by all the academies. <laughs> Join the club. But uh, yeah. It's he does the job really, really well, and the premise. What's he doing? The, well, the premise is they take four couples who have been together for a while, <laughs> so that they're appropriately tired of each other. Okay. And then bring them to an island, Temptation Island, 
where the women are separated and go to live in one house with a bunch of hot guys and the guys live in a house with a bunch of hot women, you know, so they're tempted and then they go on dates with these people and they literally almost prop up their penis and say, here it is. So we see what happens. The four couples, you know, and they, of course they, they're evil. They film your date with the person who's tempting they you. Show, your- show it to the other person. It's like <laughs> cockfighting, you know. That's it's hilarious. like It is hilarious. And then like at the end, it is who stays together? Who broke up? Like this last season, there was a guy who lasted like one day. <laughs> he got to the house with the chicks, and he was like, "You know what? I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make it through this anyway. I might as well get laid on the first night." You know, other people make it all the way through because they resist temptation on Temptation Island. Again, I don't know why I'm like promoting this show, except you asked me about. Guilty pleasures. I think. Yeah, I mean, we all got anyway. it. God damn, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna watch this. Well, now. Mike, I have to get back to my real job. Oh, I love and respect you, sir. I thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> I, I dinner. I We're having dinner. We are having dinner. Come okay. <laughs> Do you need this? You no, need I'm, this? I got plenty. And your, your, your drug dealer friend gave me a lot of that. My drug dealer. It's a legitimate business in California. Thank you, man.